I was giving it to him when the wall fell. I'm not the camera. I couldn't be a camera. I couldn't be Mr. Issy Bullock. But I could be a data producer. So you've gone from the IMF through the OECD, which engages with people, that I actually had the task of being in Berlin uh, when the wall fell. You couldn't ignore it if you're interested in societies. And what could you do as a social scientist? Well, where does data come from? It can come from institutions, referred to the institutions. But when the institutions, the very foundations collapse, and that was a collapse of the communist system, because it was as integrated, more integrated than the IMF, the OECD, and the whole thing collapsed. And people who had been studying those statistics and relying on the consistency of lying, Alec Nevis phrase, they tell a lie and then they give you true trends, true observations. Alec was a bit naive on that point. But everything collapsed. What do you have left? 400 million people who have to survive. And some of them are there because they survived through 1938 through 1946-49. And afterwards, the people I was studying were very good and getting out of the way of official statistics because officials were not always regarded as user friendly. <laughs> so you had a complete collapse, and my response was to design a questionnaire. Now, the alternatives for questionnaire construction are to use standard questions tested in Western settings. This is a familiar strategy, and it was applied by a large number of groups. You get comparable data in a situation that's only half comparable. It struck me as odd that people wanted to understand <coughs> what was different, and they thought they could do it through familiar means. And it was explained to me, in fact, in Washington, D.C., in the World Bank, not the fund. That the way to get, the thing to do was to start with the 1972 UN Protocols on National Income Accounts, then to take net material product in 1989, which was an accounting system that rejected money in markets, and turn it into U.S. dollars at 1989 prices. Uh, prices. How do you do this? with some difficulty in shutting their eyes to reality. And I asked why, and I was told there was an infinite demand in the bank and the fund to have a number as a baseline. And one of the people who told, who did this, was more metaphysical, and he ended up giving up on GDP, which is a construct. And I was simply going around trying to find out what it was that one needed to measure. And the point was to turn anecdotes into data. This is very important because if you cannot relate your constructs back to observable phenomena. Now, I'm not saying that because GDP cannot be related back. Because there's a, it's a construct at such a high level that you can't get back to something you can photograph. I'm not saying it's useless, but it's not completely adequate as the OECD presentation reminded us. Well, Mansur also in the social indicators movement had seen that one in 1970. <clears throat> and what I had was this basic model of total welfare in the family as household plus market plus state and political evaluations like, is this form of government better than the previous one? Churchill said democracy was the first form of government, except what had already, uh, already been tried. And the people I was interviewing have plenty of experience. These were hypothetical questions, because the older ones have been through three, four, five regimes, 
and a couple of barriers as well, if you think about the Baltic states. Social capital, getting things done, the Jim Coleman approach, a productive resource, not a subjective feeling of trust. But if social capital is capital, what does it produce? And there was a very interesting uh, uh, World Bank work on this, led by this man, Sarah Gelder. Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. I'll get back to where I was. Where are it? There, stop, hold, stop there. Right, okay. <coughs> These were the countries of the years covered. If I've asked the wrong question once, I've asked it more than a hundred times. And the whole point of a questionnaire is if you think conceptually, you can then be comparative. And I started out in Bulgaria in what was then Czechoslovakia. And of course that forces you to get your, your third country, which is a conceptual country, rather than just taking numbers, to think what you want to know and uh, to work with people who live in the countries as I said, uh, don't ask questions that they think are stupid. <laughs> and there's a great tendency for people to produce what you want. Um, one, many anecdotes, people, Russians could go to Harvard, be trained to collect what somebody wanted. Why not? That's a market economy. They supplied that for which there was demand. Did they believe it? Well, that's a separate question. But there's a very large mass of data out there now. This is the sort of thing you could get out of it. You see, I was creating unofficial data, and that made me a World Bank consultant for more than a decade. Because the bank people who were on the ground, as they would be in developing countries, know that there's a lot going on that's not in the official statistics. And if you're going to develop a country, or transform, or turn it around, or fill the gaps, you've got to deal with the whole of the country, and not just a few indicators, which aggregate and aggregate and keep on aggregating. <coughs> um, the smaller dots represent people who can uh, get by, buy what they need without borrowing money from their official job. In other words, they can sustain themselves indefinitely. And you can see that there are big differences between Russia and Slovenia, which is, can, fits common sense. The black lines are what they can get with unofficial economies, which are either uh, so-called black shadow economies, which are outside national income statistics, but affect GDP by the import and the export of the economic data activity in and out of the official framework. You've got to ask, what does the official framework measure that which is official? What does it leave out? That's the OECD thing, is that which is not officially cognized. And what's interesting here is that across a very wide range of countries where official economies were quite different, most people were able to cope, that is to buy what they needed in terms of food, clothing, and heat from a mixture of official, unofficial economies and household production. Here is an attitudinal question, the Churchill hypothesis. <coughs> um, how much support, not only what do you do, are you satisfied with democracy? I didn't use this type of question. Because it presupposed Russia was a democracy. And the country you were, people were living in was a democracy. But is to ask them their support for alternative systems, including the present system, which won't point at that. There's a great deal, I think, in survey construction about asking about what people can observe or what you can point at. This system. Don't name it. People know what you mean by this system. 
And if you start presupposing, you know what it is. But this shows that there was a no demand for alternatives. And I wrote a book on it, testing the Churchill hypothesis, democracy and its alternatives. On social capital, I had a long dialogue with Bob Putnam because he thought social capital made nice. But of course, you have two ways to do things nice and not so nice. And social networks are a mere phenomenon. They're a universal. But you have to move from universals to differentiate. And <coughs> with World Bank support, I was able to develop a special purpose questionnaire about modern organizations providing social capital that works, informal alternatives, growing food, borrowing money from a friend, which is much less bureaucratic <coughs> than going to some um, uh, income support industry, which might take two months. Personalized things, big control, anti-modern, use connections, pay cash on the side to jump the queue. All of these things happen. What was really striking when one looked at countries in transition was how few people felt excluded. It was more a question of her assignment. If you want something or if you're dissatisfied, keep searching trial and error until you find it. And I think trial and error models have something to be said from them. I think if you put that on the op-ed page in the Financial Times, I hope people would say, gee, that's what I've been doing for the past two years. <laughs> Another thing one can do is, with this type of survey, a barometer, is to measure changes. And what this graph shows is <coughs> two things using multi-level modeling with time and interaction effects, you can get how your independent variable changes. Um, people's attitudes toward freedom, feeling freedom than before did change. Their attitude toward democracy is an ideal change. But also your regression coefficients change. I think one of the <coughs> um, problems with a lot of data is that people just want simple bivariate relationships or alternatively they want to get journal articles published and forget description. Let's just stay at the inferential level and with logic and probate and polynomial logic. It's very easy to be non-descriptive. But I think one has to go, it's, it's dialectical, one has to find ways of going back and forth. Um, certainly if one wants to reach the policy making community, let alone the um, journalistic and the common sense community. Here, we were able to use the multi-level model time, which is, a, which is always progressing. We could measure, this was a Bill Mishner, my co-author, the effect of the passage of time of getting people to adapt to the situation as it actually is. <clears throat> and I think that this is one of the things that may come up with the well-being happiness surveys. Because people who see that somebody who's, let's say, halfway down below the median, 25th percentile, they can either, they will look unhappy to David Halpern down the street, but then they have to adapt in some ways. And it's how people adjust to things that they don't, where they would like to have something better, but when they don't have something better, how do they adapt is to less than optimal or unsatisfactory solutions. <coughs> well, let me come to this last slide. How does one approach a complex data set? This is really what we've been seeing in these IMF and OECD 
of barometer surveys. Um, first of all, you have to ask, what, what are you looking for? Is it a country and, and why? If you say you want to find out about well-being, that's not very helpful. And the whole business of defining your search saying, why am I signing on to this website? Why am I looking up this data? Before you interrogate a database, you should interrogate it yourself. And I think there's, uh, in some senses, there's a tendency for people to rush into data without asking, what are they looking for? <coughs> and the second way, where and when, because the key thing, since I started doing this work, I go back to the Catherine Silver and IBM cards and humping them back on planes from Rome and Paris and places like that, um, is there's more than enough data out there. There's not always as much intelligent interrogation or purposes of looking at data. In my own case, I, had to, I broke it up into what started as uh, new democracies, new Europe, and ended up as 10 countries that are now in the EU. And because more than a million euros came from Vienna, it also included Ukraine, because they were part of the IMF constituency, and also because they were part of Austria before 1914. But you find boundaries change, countries change. <coughs> Russia, one was able to do more surveys and experiment. Balkans is another world as well when you look at samples from Boston and Herzegovina. You begin to realize that these are not, uh, the more you know about the context, the more it helps you. But you have to figure out which country is why. What are my key concepts? What measures are there in the questionnaire? And the interesting thing in these three talks this morning is uh, the fund collects highly aggregated data from, from organizations like national governments to get information from organizations like trade associations. They get organizations from legal personalities who are, who are easy to find, but are not people. <coughs> and then with Danny Kaufman and others in the World Bank governance indicators, they interview an organization, a company. But when you think about it, they go to somebody and say, what, does, how, what are the obstacles to getting things done? how much corruption, how much inefficiency, and they're rather dependent upon who they can draw. <clears throat> but there's microeconomic data, and you can't have an economy without people. People, the good news is, not only have people been living for thousands of years without GDP and national income accounts before Simon Kuznets and others came along, but when the whole thing collapsed in 1901, 1989. And it was really the Michel Cambrissou's general direction who went to Moscow and the sources of data were talking uh, to Boris Yeltsin. I heard him exactly. Boris Yeltsin selected members of the Duma and the Patriarch of the Russian Orthodox Church. And the editor of the IMF weekly newsletter realized you don't get fired for printing the statements of the director general. But this is the problem that if you don't go back to your micro foundations. I think there's a big problem in a lot of comparative surveys especially, where people come in and ask what do what do people what the respondents prefer rather than how do they what do they make of what they what is supplied, both their own resources plus the resources of state and market, because this is what they must deal with first of all, rather than, and if 
they propose something different and don't have it, well then the question is what happens next? And equally, this is social behavior, preferences, what the well-being studies show, and I've worked with the European Foundation Dublin surveys 2003-2007 and with other next year is, surprise, surprise, it's health and family. And this is where, because, where the state has a weak advantage, as Alan would really point out many years ago. Well, if you want to know how this data can be used, the advantage of a survey and the Afrobarometer would be a second example, is that it can have modules of social, microeconomic, political. In other words, if you have, even in a 20-minute questionnaire within a 40-minute questionnaire, a survey can be multi-purpose. <coughs> and that the tendency, I think, of too many academics is to be too narrow. And the more detailed your questions, the less likely they are to be meaningful in a comparative context. In comparison, it's the big differences that count, whereas in a single rational survey, it may be the more nuanced differences. Um, I published a book, not too long, um, summarizing 20 years of work, and I really had to write a 10 or 15 page comment on the sources and which things I published previously were still worth looking at, and where I got my ideas from in other books. <coughs> where do you go for the data? You can find it in the UK Data Archive, and I would suggest you first go to my own website, if you're interested in this, just to get a hang of what, what will happen if you tell Essex to send me all the data. Thank you.